back. It is time for another edition of the Soonerscoop.com podcast as we just get back from Dallas. And uh, it is time for our post-Big 12 Media Day wrap-ups. We are now joined by Eddie Radosevich. Eddie, welcome back to the program. Thank you, sir. And uh, Joe Duvall, who is with us in Dallas as well, for his first Big 12 Media Days. Joe, how you doing? Doing great today. How you guys doing? Good, Joe. So, you know, it was your first Big 12 Media uh, Days. I Had you ever gone, like, with when you were working for uh, Sooner Vision or Sooner Sports or whatever? No, I had never gone before. This was my uh, first ever trip. So uh, just overall, and Eddie can tell you this, I thought it was kind of a, a down year. Mm-hmm. Maybe I had it built up in my head to be bigger than it was, but it just didn't seem quite like the, the uh, attendance maybe that, that I was used to in the past. Ja- Eddie? Uh, yeah, it was a little different. I mean, we were sitting there down Sunday night, kind of as everybody rolls in, everybody kind of meets down in that bar at the bottom of uh, the Omni, and uh, we talked about it then. There there was a lot of people there, and I thought maybe just because that Baylor, the story nationally was such such a big thing, I thought it yeah, was going to be, be like, people. like just everybody down there, but it, it really wasn't, and I think that you know a, a lot of it has to do with... Uh, I, I don't think stations want to spend the money to go down there, and then if you can pull it off FTP that you know there's probably some stations out of dallas and waco that just didn't go but yeah i mean it was it was a little different but uh you know from the oklahoma side of things i thought everything went really well and we'll discuss that more later i'm sure yeah Yeah. and uh joe i don't know if you were expecting like more weird or anything like that there wasn't a whole lot of weird there was my radio partner spinozzi with his grapevine chamber of commerce question and (laughs) He likes throwing an accusatory question at, at, at Bob Bowlesby every year. So that was probably about... There was some weird stuff that we're going to play for you during this podcast that, that was asked to Bob Stoops. And there was some chick asking about Pokemon. Uh, and none of the players were like, I don't play Pokemon. I don't know what you're talking about. And she just kept asking questions because it fit her story. Yeah. So. But Joe, just kind of your first impressions. You know, I don't really have a basis of comparison. Uh, but f- from what I could tell, it, w- it was... Uh I mean, there, you guys might be selling it a little short. I mean, you're in that room and that uh, big ballroom where the coaches speak. Uh, looked like you know hundreds of reporters are there. It was a unique experience for me, uh, at least doing it for the first time. Uh, it wasn't you know like wacky like the Republican National Convention or anything. There's not crazy people running around yelling things except for your man Spinozzi. But I, there was still fun things. I mean, Bob Bob Bowlesby kind of uh, had a bit of a train wreck in his opening statement. Uh, Baylor was under fire the entire weekend. Uh, you had a Texas fan sitting in the audience grilling Walt Anderson about calls he, they made against the OSU game. So that's my one true disappointment that I don't. I'm gonna have to find that, but I heard it was glorious. I was we were still doing radio, but I heard that the guy had like note cards and he was reading his question directly and everything. And egregious was used. Uh, I need to find a transcript before we're done here, but he had all kinds of accusatory words thrown in there. Did somebody actually ever figure out, was he like a reporter that just posed as a He worked a for the Texas Scout site. Oh. Yeah, I think he was, might so, have been an intern. He was he was young. Uh, I think he might actually still go to UT, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that, 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 that could explain sense. a lot. Cheap labor. Yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, you know, like you said, I, I thought you, you know, the big stuff I thought you hit on pretty well, uh, Mike Gundy's hair. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, got Eddie Radosevich uh, featured on Barstool Sports, which is his favorite it's website. Go-to. It's probably even more favorite website than Soonerscoop.com. No, they don't They don't cover uh, recruiting news like we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was it was good. And then, of course, we got to Oklahoma. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was I, – I thought everybody – Dusty uh, Dvorak and I had talked about it, and, and he'd said that he'd kind of talked to Bob a little bit before he'd come down and said he was going to be in a really good mood, and I thought Bob was fantastic. I, it was as good in a media setting as he has been in a long time, of course, coming off the college football playoff. You got your quarterback returning for, you know, and he gets an extra year during the offseason. Really, uh, everything seems to be going Oklahoma's way, so there was the, there was no reason for him to really be grumpy at all. Recruiting's going well. Recruiting's uh, going very well. This was before the Marquise Hayes news came out on uh, Wednesday, or I guess today. Uh, you know, I, somebody had texted me, and I didn't catch it, but I guess Baker said that, uh, he even said that Bob has his, quote, juice back. Yeah. Yep. I wasn't around for that, but 
uh, it does seem like he's in a really good mood. And outside of the Jordan Thomas news, uh, there it was kind of the first time in a while that he didn't really have to field any answers about a, about players getting in trouble, about uh, any type of uh, extracurricular activities off the field uh, for his players. And so I thought it was uh, it was all really good. And you know, even uh, I, there was a question about you know just Bob's health in general. And uh, he said that you know I think this is just another year coming out of that hip surgery that he just feels really good. He's not. He's not being nagged by anything. It's almost like we can we can go back and trace the cloud over the program. Like now we can add his hip to the 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 list of things along with aging coaches that weren't recruiting yeah. hard, uh, facilities that had fallen behind. So it's almost like I I guess I don't know what what would that period start? Maybe like <laughs> I hate to say this, but does it kind of coincide with the Landry Jones period, the Landry Jones era? Yeah, I mean, I, it might. The post-Sam Bradford era, the hey. post-2000. I guess it's post-2008 to... It uh, kind of all started you know. that 2009 year with the Gresham news, and then since then it's been all downhill. It's kind of was multiple prong, too. I mean, you had you know Bobby Jack Wright was getting up in age. Uh, uh, Jackie, uh, Jackie, Ship. Jackie Ship had kind of uh, fallen Checked off in recruiting, out. and... Uh, you know, Bruce Kittle wasn't the best hire. And no, so, that's a and that's a good point. Losing Kevin Wilson, losing was Kevin a big, Wilson, yep. big blow to the program uh, because they never really recovered there from the offensive coordinator position. The energy on uh, from the assistant coaches has seemed to uh, it's it's that early two thousands level that fans kind of mention a lot. And I think uh, having Baker Mayfield say, I was sitting right there when he said it. He he said Bob Stoops has his juice back, and for Baker to say that implies that he didn't have it before well you know what what else is i think interesting is that team last year with all the the big personalities i think that helped recharge bob stoops as well like when you have an eric striker um who am i who am i leaving out zach, zach sanchez, sanchez i mean charles tapper you have all these guys that that make it fun to go to work yeah. every day i think baker fits into that mold as well uh i thought it was really interesting how many times did guys bring up Matt Romar to you guys? Because it was a constant Constant. With me. Stoops especially. I feel like Stoops yeah. made it a point to bring up Romar not only a lot, but he would bring him up first. It, it was one of the first names out of his mouth. Well, that's that's good news for Oklahoma if they want to if they want to compete and try and get back to a semifinal this year for a guy to be that big in the middle. Well, you know what's funny about Matt Romar is he's not a real talkative guy. He looks very mean. He's a very scary, intimidating yeah. looking person. He's almost like a, a, he looks a little, like people always talk about Samaj P. Ryan looks like a 35-year-old man. Matt Romar looks like, kind of like the king of the yard. Like he is just, and yes, I did just use a prison term. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like just a badass all the time. And he, he just, he never changes his, his, his expression. When you talk to him, you're kind of like, is he mad at me? You know, what's going on here? So, it's obvious the team loves that guy. He's I, a first off the bus guy. I I remember a few years ago when he first got there, and I was uh, working back in the athletic department, and somebody told me uh, it was Jerry Montgomery was still there that Montgomery basically loved Romar and thought he was quote a fire hydrant, just somebody you can plug in the middle. He's not going to get a lot of penetration, but he's going to eat up blockers and he's going to be strong and hold his ground. Uh, and I think that's something that Oklahoma is going to use in their three man front and need a lot. So that's something he brings to the table that maybe some of the other guys who uh, can get in the backfield more, maybe more athletic, can't do, and he can be a situational guy for them. And the one thing that that did that really impresses me about Stoops, after you know covering him for eighteen years, uh, his confidence in this team it's not it's not a false confidence. Mm -hmm. He's not trying to sell you on things like the the only time I could think of Bob really talking like he was selling a little too hard was he was talking about Charles Walker. Uh, he, and he said, by the way, his cast has been narrowed down and narrowed down, and he's doing more and more in the weight room, and they expect him to be uh, fully you know, ready to go by the time the season gets here. But he started talking about, he's like, you know, uh, even when you lift weights with one arm, it, it affects the other, the other pectoral. And, and, and he goes, well, maybe not a whole lot. <laughs> so, I mean, okay. It was, it's just like he was very positive about things, and they're really, I, I'd ask him at one point, like, is there anybody that's not here that you kind of felt bad you didn't have room for, you know, player representatives? And uh, he named off like three guys. Like he feels really good about the way that this team has grown and matured over the summer. 
I thought it was interesting just watching the uh, like the Snapchat filters from the OU players uh, in the in the plane and everything on the way down. They were like joking around, and you could tell that Bob was sitting there with them and kind of joking around with yeah. them too. And uh, it's just a very loose atmosphere right now. And I think that that's that's something that you want going into uh, you know the non conference schedule, obviously, and the start of the season being so important. One of the big questions going into it, just personnel wise, was Jordan Thomas and his status arrested earlier this month. Uh, for uh, assault and battery in a campus corner bar. Uh, and Bob Stoops uh, addressed that uh, several times uh, yesterday in Dallas. And uh, here he is on Jordan Thomas. Uh, nothing. He's uh, He right now is working through that process. Everything hasn't been decided yet. Uh, so once we know exactly what all the charges end up being and, you know, that, then we'll have something to say about it. So, you know, essentially, reading between the lines, and I've talked about this on the site and on the radio, and the first thing I told people was, let's see what happens to some of these charges. Because uh, is this something that, you know, where Jordan Thomas kind of got into it with a a bouncer, and it, you know, it really doesn't qualify as assault and battery? Uh, I I think we have to wait and see what charges are. Uh, eventually put on Jordan Thomas before we decide uh, exactly how Oklahoma is going to handle him. And Bob Stoops, he wouldn't come out and say that if he was pretty confident or if he wasn't confident that this wasn't as bad as the initial you know reports had indicated. It definitely is not as bad as I thought it was when we you know I wake up to news that this happened and we start investigating it and. Uh, it was on a Thursday morning. I was on vacation. <laughs> the, the worst. I think time. I just woke up. Oh, barely opened my eyes, got out my phone, went to the uh, Cleveland County Sheriff's website, found the link, tweeted it to you guys, DM'd it to you guys, and said, "Here, you deal with it." <laughs> it was, and it was not good when you look up and the first thing you see is assault and battery. Yeah, and uh, and first off, you think, "Oh God, was it a girl?" Yeah, like, that, honestly, it's that's the bad thing. Yeah. It was like, who did he hit? But then more and more came out, and it's like, I don't know. You can't kick. You're you're not going. I guess you can, but you're not going to kick off a starter off the team for getting into a bar fight. It's just I, not going to happen. I think one of the interesting things, though, was I mean, I, I agree with you all. When that news first went down, I think uh, any uh, sane person thought that being kicked off the team was a possibility, and now it's almost a question of is he even going to be suspended. But he he wasn't being brought up unprompted he if you you had to ask about jordan thomas to get people to talk about jordan thomas right if you asked about defensive leaders his name never came up and it was noticeable uh, jordan evans when naming guys that stepped up on the defense he named six seven guys and none of them were jordan thomas so uh, it's something that you can tell that he he's he's disappointing people at the very least and i think you know you saw when ou was releasing some of their summer videos early in the summer like they had jordan thomas mm-hmm. front and center on some of that yeah so you're right joe i mean he's obviously disappointed the staff uh i think there are definitely some some issues he's going through family issues he's going through uh where they're they're trying to be patient with him trying to be mindful of uh you know some things but at the same time the kids got a little bit of knucklehead in him you wouldn't think that a chemical engineering major would have a little knucklehead in him but he clearly does and he needs to straighten some stuff out or he's going to throw away a, a really good future i mean it sounds like he just needs to grow up doesn't it at, at- I guess at the the bottom of all of it, just grow up a little bit, have a little bit maturity. Uh, you know, just don't put yourself in the position that he's put himself in uh, multiple times now. I mean, he's clearly a smart guy. Like Kerry said, he's a chemical engineering major. He was committed to Northwestern in high school before he switched to OU because of their academic prowess. And I, you know, to play armchair psychologist here, you know, m- maybe you got that active mind. You got, he's you got to get it to good use. Maybe it's a different environment. Uh, things are changed and. Uh, I hope that maybe he can find a, a better outlets than what seems to be happening because it's not been going too well for him off the field. And it's it's not been awful, but there, these things have been happening since, you know, last year. Well, and, you know, I, I think the thing, last thing I want to say about Jordan Thomas before we move on is, uh, and I think, you know, I'd had, had it out a little bit with Traber on the radio about this stuff, but, uh, you know, the, the piling up of transgressions for Jordan Thomas, it, it is concerning, and I don't think you can just ignore it. But at the same time, not paying a traffic ticket, 
uh, missing a meeting is what he got suspended for in the the game where he got suspended for a quarter. Now I think the Tulsa game that was a major screw up. Yeah. I mean that's I think that was the worst out of all of them. That really Stoops kind of ignored that one. <laughs> um, but you miss a game and you screw over your team the Friday before that game. You screwed over PJ and Banasor. Um, I you know there I think there's a reason to be concerned. But at the same time. I don't think you can lump this all up into, okay, these are reasons why he shouldn't be here. So, And Stoops did address that several times when, when, whenever he was asked, like you said, about Jordan Thomas. All right, uh, I think we knew that you know, Baker Mayfield, we, it's, we've been fortunate. You know, we've had a chance to talk to Baker out at summer camp and stuff after uh, he got his, uh, his extra year of eligibility back. So we knew that that would be a topic like, you know, the national guys like Dennis Dodd, Bruce Feldman and, and guys that were there, you know, really hit hard on that story. But, uh, really other than just talking about his team and the summer and things like that, you know, Baker's just kind of Baker. I mean, you know what you have with him. I, first thing that kind of struck out to struck me was he looks different. He looks like he's lost a lot of weight. Uh, he actually looks taller now that he's thinner. Yeah, a little bit. And I thought maybe he just like his face looked a little thinner. It does. Uh, it might yeah. have been the hair too that he's yeah. got it cut. But uh, he's yeah, he like was Travis cut. He was he held court and uh, did his thing at the uh, during the breakout session. That it was pretty good listening to him talk and uh, all the things that he hit on. He threw a couple punches at some you know jabs at people and it was fun. He was he was less bitter to me than I've ever seen him in an interview setting like there wasn't there wasn't that chip on his shoulder yeah. just talking to the media like there has been in the past he was definitely making statements more than just talking noise on people yeah I guess would be the best way to put it well here's a little bit of Baker I had a chance to catch up with him uh just to talk about all that stuff and how he goes forward kind of motivating himself now that he doesn't have Cliff Kingsbury and Texas Tech to hate do you like it that, that people look at you as a guy that plays with a chip on your shoulder? I do. I, I think that's just, just how I am. So um, uh, that's who I am, and I'd like for people to see the real me, um, and, and I appreciate that. How, has that chip been chiseled away a little with you know no. getting the extra year of eligibility, not having the tech stuff looming there anymore? I mean, what, what do you use for motivation? I, I find my own fuel. Uh, it's not necessarily anything from the outside. I can I can drive myself, and I always have been able to be self motivated, and I think that's kind of key to, to getting to where I'm at right now and, and, and pushing forward to where I want to be in the future. Is, is one of those things maybe like. I don't know, you got that extra year, and people were like, oh, Baker's going to be here for two more years. Well, you know, NFL might be an option for you. Yeah, it, it's stuff like that. People saying that I'll never make it in the NFL, that I'm undersized. That's, that's still stuff I keep in the back of my mind, so uh, I'll always remember that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, he's going to find other ways to motivate himself. He's going to he's gonna look at, you know, when the draft list come out of the top quarterbacks for 2016 or 2017 in the 2017 draft, I mean, He's going to hang that on his wall, probably, in his locker. Just He'll find ways to be motivated. Baker was Baker. Uh, he, he's one of those guys where he's going to be authentic. and uh, at, he, he even says that himself. He says, I, I like to be truthful. I like to let people know where I stand. That way you know I'm not being fake. You don't have to worry about that stuff. And you know, he'll, He would say things like, if I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to find ways to be motivated. That's how I kind of play well. I have to feel like I'm I'm fighting against something. And uh, he said it's not that hard for him to seek out some criticisms. And anybody who knows uh, college football fans knows that's true. There's going to be people out there that are criticizing him and he can find it if he wants to. Uh, it's just about selecting the information he takes in. I'm so excited for October 22nd already when he was talking about going to going back to Lubbock. Yeah, he said he was going to catch tortillas from the fans and <laughs> and take a bite. Yeah, he, he was talking about it, and I, I'm just already excited for that trip down there. Oh, he was snickering when he was talking about that. You could tell he was uh, he was being a little playful. He's going to have some fun with the fans down in Lubbock. Well, it's clear that the the tech administration and Cliff Kingsbury. I mean, Cliff Kingsbury came out and said, "Yes, we supported the Mayfield rule. We voted for it." Uh, but he still has the fans, you know, to yeah. to motivate him. So. And we know their fans are... They're, they're not giving him a break. We'll say that. Their fans are... They're the biggest a-hole fans in the conference. Being on that field over the years, I can't... It's just... It's, and it's not like... And they're not the loudest. Mm -mm. They're not the most loyal. They're just the jerkiest. We need the J.D. Runnell sound right now. Yeah. That may have something to do with my warped perception of no, tech I, fans. No, I think you're dead on. I, I'm trying to think... 
Kansas State's pretty hardcore. Yeah. West uh, Virginia. Well, you had a little kid flip you off in the Kansas yeah. State uh, galley. That kid's probably like 13 now. In jail. Five, in more, five more years, I'm going to find him and beat his ass. <laughs> <laughs> West Virginia fans had a few choice words for my beanie with the little uh, bob I remember on top. that, yeah. yeah. I remember you getting you you telling the story of being harassed. The thing about West Virginia is we've always gone up there when they're on uh, their, I guess, Christmas break or or lack thereof. So it's never really been like yeah, it was up. empty. Yeah, it's been it's never really had a a full campus atmosphere. I guess. By the way, was anyone are they the least or were they the most ignored team at Big Twelve Media Days? West Virginia, they were there on the day with Baylor, Texas, and Oklahoma. Probably so. They're far from home. So they don't have as much media that are going to be covering them. God, yeah. if you're like a West Virginia beat writer, Big 12 Media Days is gold for you. You, you basically just have free reign to ask whatever you want yeah. to whoever. It's, uh, you know what I was surprised to seem not to get that much coverage as you would expect was Texas. It, it didn't seem like there was much buzz following Texas around. I, I would look at the Oklahoma players and coaches during the breakout, or, and you know it was tough to find space to talk to Baker Mayfield, to talk to Bob Stoops, to talk to Samaj P. Ryan, and you'd look over at the Texas side. and I It's because all the people from Austin, like the TV stations, they wanted to talk to Baker Mayfield because he's from Lake from Travis. Austin. I mean, that, that was the thing. Like All the Oklahoma City TV stations... By the way, did you see what I was doing to their tripods? No. Sabotage? I I hate the TV people so much. Like this happens at Thunder practices where they just position themselves with Eddie at least got in the fray because he knew if you didn't set your tripod up right yeah. in front of the the uh, the the dais or the ta- it's just a table. I don't know why I'm using fancy words. It's just a, so you set it right up in front of the table. You, you they have telephoto lenses. I mean, you don't have to put it right in stoops. Like his, their microphone or their their cameras lenses were as close to Stoops' face as my microphone is right now. I wanted to go through and just punch every one of you. That, that's one, even th- you, Eddie. I never understand that when guys like I was looking over at Baker Mayfield once, and there must have been fifteen guys with hands and recorders and cameras less than a few inches away from his face. And unless you're doing like a live stream onto the radio where you need crystal clear audio, if you're just going to transcribe later, just give him a little step back. You have to do space. this. You have to get up though. You have to get up there because if you don't, you'll just get blocked out by everybody yeah, else. Yeah, I know. Uh, you got to fight. It's, it's a, a it's a it's a fight that you have to you have to make. I'm still too soft. I have to get hardened, I guess. No, yeah, we get hardened. Yeah. I just I just walked up on the stage and sat there and put my mic where I wanted to put it. I give no Fs. The best is when uh the ESPN guys, you start getting in with them like during the season, during like post game, especially on the road. They're uh, mean, be, yeah. I mean, you—they will you jab have, you. You have to get in there. You have to get. That's why off season's so important for the uh, photojournalists. <laughs> so you're saying that you're in great physical condition to deal I, I with the I will be season? in a month. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think playing golf and drinking beer qualifies as working out, Eddie. Just gonna tell you. I know, but no matter what your Fitbit says, <laughs> I I I'll get there though. We'll get there. Yeah, I can't say anything i i haven't worked out in a week now so all right uh you know one of the things that i think has kind of been overlooked and i think we notice it more because we're at summer camps and stuff and you see samaj ap ryan and we haven't seen him for so long and the first time you see him after a few months it's always mm-hmm. shocking like holy crap how is anybody that big and we saw him kind of showing people how to go through rope drills and it dawned on me like hey he had surgery in the off season. Like, he looks pretty good. So I just couldn't help but want, you know, be kind of marvel at the fact that he recovered so easily from that surgery. And I talked to him at media day, and he told me something I didn't even know. I hadn't really dug into it that much. He kind of gave me the details of why he had surgery. And you remember, he's a guy that kept suffering sprained ankles all the time. So uh, I wondered, like, hey, you know, did the surgery kind of help you out with not spraining your ankle so much and here's kind of that conversation one thing about your your ankle when you had that surgery does that do you think that that will limit maybe some of the the sprains and stuff that you thought of last year oh yeah um you know uh, once i got once T- the tcu incident happened then um you know my doctor said that it's been cool. something wrong with like that, that with that ankle for a long time. You know. Is it like a stretched ligament that they had to tighten? Uh, one was stretched, one was torn, and 
I don't even see it's a lot of stuff that they did in there. But um, you know, just to just to uh, you know clarify um, that there was actually something wrong with it for a while, and that yeah. it wasn't just it wasn't just a freak accident. So I think that's it's interesting too. I think for you know NFL stock is you know he's going to be known if he goes through this year without injury. It's going to lessen, but up to this point, I think you, if you're an NFL guy and you're rating running backs and you're looking at uh, durability, I think there's probably a question about his durability because he's had so many ankle sprains. Especially at that position where it just seems like, you know, guy, really good running backs end up falling because of stuff like this. But to know he had a torn ligament, I mean, yeah. in his ankle, I mean, that's that's pretty huge in terms of having that repaired and... He's now healthier than he's probably been since he was first on campus at Oklahoma. You'll hear stories about guys that come back from these surgeries, and they, they'll say things like, yeah, this is the best I've actually ever felt. It's a little different from when uh, I remember growing up and when guys would have surgeries. It wasn't like they came back better. It was just you had surgeries, and all right, well, what's he at now, 75 80%? And, and it seems like medicine now has gotten to the point where these guys go under the knife, and they come out better than they were before. Uh, so... He was running on one ankle for a lot of times last year, so I, you're right, Kerry. I wouldn't be shocked if uh, he looks a little more spry this year than he did last year, which is a scary notion for Big 12 defenses. It was pretty amazing to hear him talk about how after the Orange Bowl, just walking out to the team playing, he said was the hardest thing he did all all year. Wow! After the after the game, and I mean, he was he was in really really bad shape. I remember seeing him in the locker room after the game, and like he could not function he was yeah he was having trouble walking around well joe i know one of the things that you were focused on at big 12 media days uh we we'd kind of talked about what we wanted to work on uh you really dug in to talk to everyone about youngsters and guys that had really stood out uh tell us just a little bit about you know what what guys were mentioned the most uh what what your biggest impression was kind of from digging for that information i'll give you a couple thoughts uh one guy who was said that I don't think would surprise that many people, but was said consistently, was the receiver from Louisiana, Michael Jones, who was a top 100 guy last year and committed late in the process. Uh, they were raving about him, and uh, specifically Baker Mayfield, who would probably know the best. Yeah. Uh, uh, he said he's going to be a very good player by the time he leaves Oklahoma, and he, and he said he's going to help out this year. That was from Baker Mayfield, so Michael Jones is going to help out as a true freshman this year, so... Uh, maybe, need not, him. maybe not that surprising, but he's somebody that they do need to step up, and it sounds like he might be a guy that has the potential to do that. Uh, some other names I heard that were more surprising were uh, Parnell Motley, the cornerback uh, out of the D.C. Maryland era, era uh, area, excuse me, uh, was said multiple times. Ahmad Thomas, Jordan Evans, the two defensive guys that were there, both brought up Parnell as a guy that was standing out. Uh, and then I'll give you a walk-on that got mentioned twice. Jordan Evans and Baker Mayfield yeah. both brought up uh, Nick Basquin. Uh, the walk-on receiver from Norman North. Uh, if you don't remember, is he, this a Norman North thing? Are you making this up? Uh, this really happened. I swear. I, I, this I, is an alumni. Idea. I heard Reuben Hunter had is having a really good spring as well. <laughs> PC that, North grad. T what? I mean, you can joke, but he's the backup linebacker. Yeah, I know. But I, both uh, Mayfield and Evans did say uh, Basquin was a guy that they expected to play. I mean, Mayfield did say, "I, I you can." I'm a T Wolf Homer. I mean, you could probably say that. Uh, I went to Norman North. Go T Wolves. Uh, but but Mayfield, when he said Nick Basquin, I gave him a look and I said, Baker, is he really? And before I can even finish the sentence, he said, Oh, he's going to play. He's going to make catches. So uh, they take that with a grain of salt because we've heard guys in the summer before that didn't end up playing. But that's a walk on name to remember at receiver. It's it's really interesting the way that they talked about how they're going to fill the void left by Sterling Shepard and that mm -hmm. they're going to do it by numbers more than just a couple guys. So, I mean, I, I think that maybe this year the biggest difference you see in the offense is uh, the amount of guys that play. I mean, I, I know they tried to roll in a lot of guys, and that's kind of the thing that the Lincoln-Riley system has always been, or that, that style, that brand of football is you can throw in whoever and it's going to be kind of more of a system than players, but... It's going to be interesting to see if they can if they really can go four or five guys deep at wide receiver. Yeah, that was a theme Baker touched on a lot. Talking about Sterling Shepard last year was one of the best receivers to ever come through the program. Could split double teams, be a security blanket. Baker even said he could be a security blanket. Uh, and that he expects this year to be different, to spread the ball around a little more. Um, you could tell he was excited about D.D. Westbrook, said he thinks he'll get over 1,000 yards. You could tell that Baker didn't think of him as just, okay, I got to look at D.D. every play. 
Uh, he seemed genuinely um, excited to spread the ball around to see uh, how many guys can get involved. Mentioned guys like Jeffrey Mead uh, got brought up. Uh, uh, Mark Andrews, obviously, uh, Michael Jones. So there's guys that can uh, get Jarvis Baxter. There's guys that they can spread the ball to. Did anyone that you talked to, I'm not trying to go negative here. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of this because there's always, the, the offseason sucks because, you know, somebody can talk to one guy while they're going to class or something. And maybe it's, you know, maybe they're buddies with, I'm trying to think who would be, Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to go Nick Bas- Basquin, but let's say it's you know it's it's somebody that's. I'm trying to think of a good example here. Who's a receiver that really hasn't broken through? Give me, give me a guy. I give you a guy from last year. Can we do Dal- like Dal- Daron Neal? Okay, well, yeah, it's like I was thinking of a young guy that hasn't really played yet, but it is like if they're buddies with him and they say, "Oh, my buddy, yeah. he's doing great. He's going to tear it up this year," and then they're like, "Oh." So and so is tearing it up on the practice fields this far. So it's all a bunch of BS until they get on the field and do it. Uh, until you have a coach that publicly will come out and say this guy looks good. Uh, you know, I I I never really buy into it that much. But sometimes you know fans clamor for that stuff. So you say, okay, I've heard this and I've heard that. But I I think you know for the receiver position. I'm just not willing to buy in that there's going to be five guys. I don't care where you go. Any big-time program. I mean, Texas Tech is going to be hurt losing Jakeem Grant. Mm -hmm. I mean, he made so many huge trades. Oklahoma's going to be hurt by losing Sterling Shepard. I mean, when you have a quarterback that is on the same page with a wide receiver, that guy, it it goes back. Oklahoma throws the ball as much as anybody. I've seen the way that they operate. They always say, oh, we want to have five or six guys. They always have three guys that play the bulk of the minutes. I mean, last year... It was really hard for Mark Andrews to get on the field because they trusted other guys. They trusted Daron Neal, they trusted Sterling Shepard, and Deedee Westbrook. Now, Mark Andrews should have been playing more. He will play more this year. But this year, mostly, Baker Mayfield, we know, is going to trust Deedee Westbrook and Mark Andrews. Mm -hmm. And probably A.D. Miller. And then can Michael Jones step in there as well? I hate to say it, I'm not buying in on Jeffrey Mead. He just hasn't done it to this point. I don't think he's a consistent performer. He's really going to have to have a breakthrough season before I'm ready. And and not to mention, kid's barely gained a pound since he's been on campus. I'd buy Dahu more than Yeah, I Mead. would too. But Dahu has had ankle problems. He's had problems catching the football. He just has to catch the ball. Yeah. I mean, he's he was open many times last year, and particularly the one in the end zone over in there in the north end zone. I remember it. Uh, just we dropped could, it. We could build these kids up all we want, but, you know... Eventually, you just get into a Dewan Miller situation where your dad thinks that you should be playing and you really shouldn't because you can't catch the football. And then on the last day of the season, you rip the coaching staff. The guy I really like out of that group was a uh, Ad Miller. I think he's a guy that I I'm, I would expect he has to step promise. Up. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's uh, he, not at this skill level, but he's like a Malcolm Kelly type. He's a tall, lanky receiver with some moves, and I I think he might be the big target that Jeffrey Mead never could really be. I agree. Perfect example of uh, buying in on summer hype, though. I was talking to Samaj uh, uh, on Tuesday, and he was talking about, I asked him how uh, Abdul Adams was doing during 7-on-7 seven seven and mm-hmm. stuff, and he said, man, we we really don't see the freshmen a whole lot. They don't work out in the same groups. The 7-on-7 seven seven stuff that the, the freshmen are there, Samaj said that basically most of it is telling guys where to be. Yeah. And and then the other half is just for fun, that they're out there doing their own thing. Yeah. The coaches aren't out there. So that's why I think everybody on the board always wants all the summer tidbits, all these all these big news about who's doing what in 7-on-7. Seven, seven seven, but when in reality, it's basically 14 guys getting together to play 7-on-7 seven seven in the yeah. backyard. Yeah, that's important yeah. to remember that these impressions are just really based on maybe not even watching, but just buzz of, you know, if these freshmen go out and throw the ball around, play a little game, uh, then that some words will kind of leak back into the other players about who they think did well and played well. But, that, I mean, that's just all it is. It's they're messing around playing football. Nothing too serious yeah. is happening yet. And Baker, I think Baker is probably working. Like, for instance, you wouldn't have – all. you're not always going to have D.D. Westbrook and Mark Andrews working with those freshmen. You're going to have Baker Mayfield working with those freshmen. Yeah. You're going to have Austin Kendall working with those freshmen, like in one-on-one. I mean, they're, they'll, they'll take time out to go work with those guys. But it's not like you know a state seven on seven tournament where the yeah. entire team is out there at one time. So I'll now let's talk about the defensive side of the ball. Um, 
I know there's a lot. I'm going to throw this out there to you guys, and, and you tell me what you heard. But I ask, you know, I, I like asking Bob directly, this guy, this guy, because if a guy really does stand out, Bob's going to rave about him, and it doesn't happen very often. Like, you know, it happened with Adrian Peterson, mm-hmm. obviously. Um, but I asked him about Caleb Kelly, Mark Jackson. He actually doted on John Michael Terry as much as anybody. He said he loved all three of those guys, and all three of them don't look like anybody that they've had. They're just more impressive than than anyone that's come through those doors recently. But I didn't get like a, oh, yeah, Caleb. He said they'll all play. But I didn't get like a, oh, Caleb Kelly's going to reestablish this position at Oklahoma. I mean, there's still a little bit of, they're gonna, they're very talented. They're very big. They're very physical. They'll play. But I never really got like, oh, he's definitely going to be a difference maker. Yeah, Eddie and I were, uh, when they passed out the media guides and stuff initially, Eddie was flipping through the roster, looking at um, heights and weights and new guys' numbers and stuff. And he kind of paused at a number and said, and told me to look at it and said, look at what John Michael Terry, look what they have him at. 6'3", 241. I'm not quite sure I, I realized that he was that big already. Or if he's put on more weight and uh, could really fill that hole in the middle. I mean, by comparison, I think uh, what's Arthur McGinnis is... Uh, 6'1", 240. So John Michael Terry is already bigger than Arthur McGinnis. Uh, so uh, That wasn't, wouldn't have been a good thing last year. Though. No, not at <laughs> all. So that's a good thing for both of them, probably. Let's put it that way. The, the, you could tell, even going back to National Signing Day with John Michael Terry and the way that Bob talked about him, uh, there might be a little bit of that man crush developing. Oh, I definitely agree. Uh, yeah. that, that Brody Eldridge, uh, Trey Millard, J.D. Runnels mm-hmm. type man crush that Stoops forms for uh, players of... Uh, it, it seems like they're all kind of the same guy, really. Yeah, versatile. But but you guys, you tell me what kind of feedback you got on some of the because obviously the the linebacker position, that outside rush position, they need somebody yeah. to come in and give something. The that position. the name I heard that consistently uh, for somebody that they expected to step up at that position uh, is not a new name. It's Obo Okoronkwo. Same here. Yeah. yeah, that's the guy that they kept saying, and I, I've said this before. I Nobody think, volunteered uh, Ricky DeBerry, by Ricky the way. Ricky DeBerry didn't come. No. I don't think I heard Ricky DeBerry's name. I heard a couple of the Juco guys' names. I heard uh, Capri. and Yeah, I did hear Capri's name. Uh, I think you know, that was from Jordan Evans yeah. mentioned the Juco guys. Yeah, and, I mean, and Caleb Kelly, Mark Jackson obviously got brought up, but uh, yeah, you're right. I don't I, I talked to Jordan. I asked him specifically about Caleb and Mark Jackson, and he said that he kind of gave me the same thing that Samaji gave me about Abdul Adams. He said, you know, we're not in the same workout group. I've seen him do a couple seven-on-seven seven things. They will help us. Yeah. But, you know, it, it we're not going to know a whole lot until they put the pads on. They got to put the pads. I mean, that's the thing about this. They have to put the pads on. They have to start playing at the speed of what college. None of them know what the speed of college football is. And Caleb Kelly has the best shot because he's the best athlete out of all those guys. Uh, John Michael Terry is up there physically. He's ready to go. Can he handle the speed? Same thing with Mark Jackson. So it's it's. It, I'm not saying it's a crapshoot, but penciling those guys in right now, it's impossible. It just it, you just can't do it. Well, I think it's interesting with Terry is. I mean, he played outside linebacker in high school, and then Oklahoma wanted him kind of as a middle linebacker. But this year, I mean, if Jordan Evans and Tay Evans stay healthy, there's going to be not a lot of playing time in the middle. But there are opportunities on the edge, and he may absolutely he, yeah. he may not be as athletic as Obo or Ricky DeBerry, but you know, maybe he could play like a PL Lindley kind of role, a bulkier outside linebacker to come in and run situations. I yeah, I agree, and I think Mike Stoops likes doing that stuff. So you'll see a package uh, that is the striker Devonte Bond package if if those young guys prove that they're capable of playing. Now going back to Obo. That was the same thing when I asked Bob. He brought up Obo. Uh, he said that you know he mentioned him as one of their linebackers, and then he brought up Will Johnson. So they're clearly still uh, committed to going with more of the four-two-five. I think uh, where they play Will Johnson on the field is a he's a nickel, but officially he's a Sam is where he you know that that goes back to the Roy Williams days. I mean that's they take Will Johnson now is a, he's really a corner playing that safety. So you're getting. What you're doing is you're going smaller at the Roy back position and making it a true cover guy. You know, an interesting answer I heard uh, that relates to that was somebody asked Baker Mayfield about, you know, kind of the nickel position in the Big 12 now, how it's kind of um, transformed into a guy that can play in coverage, he can rush the passer, he can play linebacker, and how do you deal with that pre-snap? And Baker answered by talking about in practice how he sees that a lot and how guys like, and he said, Ahmad Thomas can do that for us. And so I thought that might have been like a tip 
uh, of their hand a little bit of how they expect to use him next year, maybe having Ahmad come off the edge and blitz a little more and somebody who can also drop back into coverage uh, near the line of scrimmage. That would be interesting with the depth that they, I think they're developing at safety that they could maybe loosen it up and, and let Ahmad Thomas drop down and play a little bit more closer. Yeah, it may not be just a structured year where guys are kind of locked into places. I think they may try to be as versatile as possible on both sides of the ball. I think that's kind of been the movement of these new coaches is to be as versatile as possible, which is, to be honest, in the mold of Kevin Wilson uh, back when they were successful back in 2008. The, it, the bottom line is kind of that they need something from Oboe. I mean, we're talking about a guy that's now going into his redshirt junior year and he has 17 career tackles. Yeah, he's in Dewan Miller territory, right? I mean, he's been somebody that's been talked about every offseason as an athletic freak to come in and rush the passer and do well. And he's had moments, but nothing consistent. So. And I think a lot of that goes to his maturity yeah. level. I mean, he got in trouble a little he, bit last he year. He was suspended. Uh, I actually was asking him a question back in the spring thinking like he was one of the guys that was... I was wrong. It was Daniel Brooks that got suspended and somebody else, but I was thinking he got suspended for the Orange Bowl. But he, it was another game, and Bob, I remember asking him about Oboe, and Bob basically said he's got academic yeah. issues. So uh, he says that's all behind him. We'll see. But, the, not yeah, I mean, having some immaturity off the field, you can look at that for every player in the history of mankind and say, why isn't he making more plays on the field? Because some of that's translating onto the field, the immaturity issues, whether it's getting lined up, lining other people up, knowing what you're doing, whatever. And, so. and that's a staple of a Stoops program is if you don't know where to line up, if I can't trust you out there, you're not on the field. Well, that's a Mike Stoops thing more than anything. <laughs> Let's say Mike Stoops needs a new water up in the press box because he just destroyed his last one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, we've talked about some of the new guys. I mean, obviously, you know, there's not a whole lot of secrets out there about, you know, what this team is trying to do that you've got a, an offense and a defense. I thought what was kind of, you know, one of the things I talked to some guys about was just the start of the season. You got Houston, uh, you got Ohio State, two of your first three games. Last year, their first big game at Tennessee, they struggled offensively for the first three quarters before winning it in overtime. Um, I just, I think, you know, I still remember seeing the Tennessee game on the other day, and they were doing the old showing Trevor Knight on the sideline. Like, we, even in that Tennessee, it's crazy to think that even during that Tennessee game, there was some question about whether Baker Mayfield was the right guy or if they needed to go back to Trevor Knight. You don't have any of that going into the season, which I think is crucial when you start off with the schedule they do. And if you remember, they're coming off of the year before going, what, 8-5? and five? And so you're in the Tennessee game a few games into the season, and uh, as we talked about before, they they weren't removed from the dark cloud at that point. It didn't feel like they were anyway. No, and, you're right. And fans at that, that Tennessee game said, all right, here we go again. I mean, we're going down the same path we've been going down. And if you remember, Lincoln Riley's offense at the beginning of the year wasn't what it was at the at the end of the year. So people were starting to... It wasn't question. what it was at the Texas game. So Yeah, that's true. So I, that 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 is something people don't... I thought When you asked that question, Kerry, I thought that was a good point because they're going to have to go to Houston game one. And they showed last year that they're going to struggle. They struggled on the road early in the season. So... Uh, I mean, Houston's not going to let up. I mean, they're going to uh, have some firepower. So uh, I don't know if Oklahoma can afford to come out of the gate slow. I talked to Baker a little bit about that, just in, in their mentality throughout the summer, throughout the workouts, and and uh, even seven on seven a little bit. Just how they've uh, they 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 they're aware of the situation. They know what's they're they're going to be facing here in about a month. So um, you know, I, I think that it's been something that I guess the best way to put it. That's something that's been addressed. It's been something that they've talked about openly. Uh, I, I talked to, I asked him if uh, any mention has been made of 2009 and the way that they went down to Dallas and got beat by BYU. And he said that, yeah, it's, it's something that's there. Obviously, Baker wasn't here uh, around at that point, but uh, it's something that they're well aware of. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, going into the season and having it in the back of your mind, I think it's good. And I think it's also good that they're going into a second year with Lincoln Riley and and everybody. They're returning so many starters on the offensive side, especially the skill positions that uh, I think it's interesting that, that it's they good, think they can play faster. I it's think a, it's it's a good comparison. I mean, 2009. Uh, as we mentioned, the, the Jermaine Gresham injury that started the season. You remember, was it Brody Eldridge that started that game at center? Yeah, I think so. And then he yeah. gets hurt, uh, and then they have to bring in, I think, uh, uh, Matt Haburn, who was, uh, I think that was his first start, maybe. Or was it Haburn that was hurt? I can't remember. Yeah, you had Tressway kicking the field goal at the end. I believe his only field goal Yeah, attempt. they put Tressway in just to try that. But, I mean, that was a BYU team 
nobody really, I mean, nobody knew that they had that in them. They ended up having a really good season, right? They, they kind of like, mirrored like what once, Houston Lost did. once to SMU, I think, that year or something like that. It was like a really weird loss. I want to say it was like the next week. Yeah. Or they, the I week think after. they lost to SMU the week after, and then they won one a out. bunch of games in a row. But... That's the I think that's the good thing for this team. Houston is not BYU. They're not, you know, a snake in the grass. They're not they're not an unknown. I mean, this is a game I guarantee you Tom Herman and his staff have put more hours in scouting Oklahoma trying to find something. For Tom Herman, this is a 6 million dollar game. Yeah. I mean, it is a contract of his choosing at Texas, Texas A&M, Baylor, wherever he wants to go. Um he knows that this game can make his career. Those Houston players know that this game can make their college career. So Houston, you know, if you're a Houston player, you get through this game, you can really think about running the table and maybe making a push at a playoff spot. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think, uh, I mean, Houston's going to treat that as their Super Bowl. They're going to be preparing all off season for Oklahoma. They're not going to even think about Game Two. But I think the good news for Oklahoma fans from Big Twelve Media Days was Baker Mayfield has this. Uh, sense of college football history which I think is kind of cool and he talked about how the opportunity to play in Houston Stadium against a high power offense like Houston who his, he's mentioned both his parents are graduates of the University of Houston so he knew all about their history and Andre Ware and the five slam pajama and then he also said I'm excited to go to play Ohio State in our new stadium you know Oklahoma and Ohio State there's two great programs I mean it's 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 he's he, you can see that genuine excitement that these are big fun games and I think when you're excited and positive going to the, into those games instead of nervous or like a days ago, that's a that's a good sign. It was interesting that he said that if uh, someone in Kingsbury would have stayed at Houston at the time of when he left uh, Lake Travis, mm-hmm. he probably would have gone to Houston. It would have worked out for him. Oh, yeah, man, imagine that team. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, there were some lighter moments uh, at, at the Big Twelve Media Days. One, we had some fun with it on the Sports Animal this morning. Uh, Bob Stoops, because here's the situation. Cliff Kingsbury was there on Monday. He's a beautiful man. I think we can all say that. Yeah. Uh, he was dressed to the nines. He looked fantastic. White suit, I think. Like a cream-colored kind of suit. It wasn't like a Kentucky Fried Chicken Colonel Matlock type white. Like he would, he could wear those suits. But yeah, like the old double-breasted, you know, white Matlock suit. But it was. He looked very good, and uh, so. People got fascinated, and he, people were asking him, like, who is he wearing and all that BS that you Which never is a question that King, when you ask Kingsbury, he knows what you're talking about. Yeah, sure. He knows. Yeah, he's into that stuff. So uh, it kind of boiled over into Tuesday when Stoops was asked uh, about his wardrobe. So yesterday we asked Kingsbury who he's wearing. Who are you wearing? What's that? Who are you wearing? What designer? Who am I wearing? <laughs> Not sure. Whatever your white bonds. <laughs> yeah. I'm not promoting anybody. It is obviously it's no one fancy since you can't see. There's, there's no no sign on it. So Hans Her- Hans Herman designs it. My tailor. How's that? <laughs> Give him some pub in Oklahoma City. So uh, HansHerman.com, you can go check it out if you want to have the same tailor as Bob Stoops. Hans Herman might be having a lot of business coming his way. I hope Hans Herman has a lot of business. Uh, he has a he has some kind of like a 1930s English car in his ta- in his office or something like. It's a we went you could there is actually a video. Um, what did I? What was I calling it? a video testimonial from Bob Stoops on HansHerman.com, and it's really bizarre because Bob starts talking without a sports jacket on or, or, or a suit a suit coat on, and the guy comes and puts it on him as he's talking, That's and he's awesome. got like the ruler around his neck, but the dude looks like uh, the second evil Cobra Kai owner in like Karate Kid Three or whatever. <laughs> He has like the long Steven Seagal slick back hair and stuff. It's perfectly really what you think a tailor Go should be. Go to HansHerman.com and check out the the Bob Stoops video testimonial. I've also tweeted uh, if that site hasn't already crashed from from being too much traffic today. I've tr- I've tweeted the video too of uh, Stoops answering the question because his facial expressions are pretty good. Are well. they? I oh, need yeah. to check that out. It's really good. I, I, I just I just like the way that she goes about goes about well, it, it sounds like, what designer <laughs> bitch I mean, it's just it like, sounds like it sounds like she's working for like gq or something and yeah. she's so put out that he doesn't yes, know like exactly what, she, what he's talking about 
I think I, when I hear Hans Herman, I, I imagine I know I think of the blonde guy in Die Hard. I know Hans Gruber isn't, the but blonde he has guy. a brother. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's the Jeremy Irons is who played that role. Yeah, no, 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 not that, not in Die Hard with the Vengeance. I'm talking in the first movie, one of the henchmen, the guy, the two brothers, one of the big blonde, the tough, one that he hangs on the chains yeah, at ho, the ho, end. Ho ho ho! Now I have a machine gun. Yes, that when I see your Hans, that's what I think. Some scary tailor that's going to intimidate me. I'd rather with a Uzi. I'd rather some nice little old lady or something. <laughs> we need to go uh, see if we can get some uh, sooner scoops suits made by Hans you know what when you and I get on the workout train and it's time to start doing right. stand-ups I'll take us all to Hans Herman how about yes. that all nice. right That's I've cool. had a suit fitted before it's a very uh, oh, you ever, yeah it's yeah. a very uh, manly experience yeah it is oh yeah it's a good feeling the other kind of just goofy stuff that happened there was in the official review it, review they were Walt Anderson does his officials press conference where they introduce the new rules and I wasn't there. I was still on the radio, but people were coming out after I was finished, and they're like, "Dude, did you hear about the Texas guy at the uh, at the Walt Anderson press conference?" I was like, "No, what happened?" They're they're like, "You've got to check this out." So they pulled it up on the cell phone, and apparently, this guy from like the Texas Scout site, we seem to think that maybe he was a student that they're just kind of getting some free labor off of. He stood up, and by the way, Joe, you did a fantastic job a- asking your first public press conference question. Oh, thank you. Talking to uh, Cliff. I yeah. appreciate that you, you know, actually weren't too embarrassed to include Soonerscoop.com. Yeah, I threw it out there. I'd get us some pub on uh, Fox Sports. You don't get any extra money this month. I'm sorry. Um, I will pay your expenses, though, because of that. Booyah. Um, so, anyway, you've got... Uh, what the hell was I talking about? The, the Texas kid. The Texas kid. Texas guy crying. The Texas guy asked a question. Now, I think, Joe, you have the actual transcript... I don't know if you have the the ability to read it uh, like a a, a pissed off Longhorn fan, but give it a shot if you want to. I'll do my best. And and keep in mind, this was the first question after the very first question. Very first question. Walt Anderson had gone over, I mean, countless videos, countless plays from the year before, targeting, talking about new sliding rules. We're there a long time, and then he finishes his opening statement about all that stuff, and the very first question comes out like this. On the game, September 26, between Oklahoma State and Texas, that was in Austin. In that game, Texas had a season-high 16 penalties for 128 yards, some of which some of which were in critical situations. After looking real deep and researching these plays, six were deemed legit, six deemed borderline, and four deemed egregious. And the last one was an unsportsmanlike contact on Coach Charlie Strong, in which the referee initiated the contact. My question is... What policies and procedures do you put in place to be sure that there's accountability for when you see things on the deplorable and atrocious level <laughs> to where it was to the point where it changed the dynamic of that game? That was a good wow. job. What did, what, how did Walt handle that? Uh, the entire room laughed for about a minute, so <laughs> he got time to compose himself and come up with an answer. <laughs> I, I, oh, his response. You never want to ask a press conference question where people just <laughs> just start, start laughing. laughing. I couldn't even look at him because I was too embarrassed for him. I didn't want to look over and see him cry, and then I would feel embarrassed for him because it was too fun to kind of laugh at him a little bit. Hundred percent chance that guy tweets recruits with the hook'em hashtag hook'em. <laughs> Guaranteed. Maybe. At least in that he'll slide into the DMs for sure. <laughs> He's from the Texas scout side, so probably. Can I get a follow back? So yeah, that was a high. I wish I would have seen that. I wish I would have been there for that. So, anything else you can think of that there was, was just there was one thing the uh, from the Charlie Strong breakout session. I don't know if you guys saw this, but uh, I guess Charlie Strong joked that uh, they somebody had asked him who they're who's going to be their starting quarterback, and it was probably the fiftieth time that he had been asked uh, on Tuesday. And uh, Strong joked that they were going to start walk on Trey Holtz, and then he followed it up with saying. If I do that, you might see on the scoreboard Charlie Strong fired. How, how are you feeling if you're Trey Holtz's family right now? <laughs> wow. Like you have no chance of playing. The the coach just threw you under the bus, and you're not even on scholarship. Yeah, you're not even on scholarship. Man, you're paying. What your a way. punch! Jeez, way to go, Charlie. Dude. I mean, I guess I think it'd be funny if Stoops joked that they were going to start bring the, bring John Reese Clark or Connor McGinnis. Bring but. John Nemo out of retirement. <laughs> Well, and one thing I was talking about uh, earlier we didn't quite get to was Bob kind of taking a mini shot at Michigan. Uh, John Shin and Lauren Transcript was was asking him about, you know, there's the new rules that they're talking about, about uh, giving, making sure players get enough time off. 
uh, during the the course of a year. Because really, we've talked about this before. Players get very little time off. Yeah. I mean, I think Stoop said it was eight weeks full of uh, the entire year calendar year that they'll have off, and most of that's you know after the football season is over. Uh, but he was kind of outlining when they get time off, and he said, "Well, you have three weeks, you know, uh, before spring break, and then a week off for spring break, unless you play at Michigan." And then he just kept going and going, and he got one of the biggest laughs of the night. But it was just kind of funny because then B- Bob did kind of his half chuckle when he realized everybody thought it was funny. Uh, so yeah, I I bet Bob and if all the people in college football, I would think that Bob and Jim Harbaugh could get along. But it it, it was funny to see him kind of because you know he has friends that that probably don't get along yeah. with with Harbaugh. I I, I I could see his brother being one of them. <laughs> Maybe I, man, I just ugh, Harbaugh, that guy. I feel like he's just in his own world. Have you ever heard the story about how he met his wife? He like asked her on a date and she said no like twelve or thirteen times. Ooh. And he just kept at it with that famous Jim Harbaugh sexy intensity. So I like <laughs> that guy's a little off to me. I'm sorry. I, he I, is. I, he's I, a good football coach. He, oh yeah, he's definitely. one of those sorry, guys that no, I say huh? all the time, coaches uh you have to be wired a little differently to be a coach. You just have to. I mean, all these guys are I mean, if they put them in a normal job, they'd be a little weird. You have to be wired differently to be a coach. And to be an offensive and a defensive lineman. That's the one thing I've learned yeah. about life when yeah. it comes to football. Definitely. So, all right. Uh, I think, you know, we've got a lot more that we're going to be getting to, especially in stories and things. And um, anything that you guys kind of want to throw out there that, that uh, you remembered from the last couple of days that really Maybe is the, worth getting out there? The most underlying, I guess, story that came out of Tuesday was the little bombshell that they dropped that they're promoting Bill Beatenbow to co-offense coordinator and Kerry right. Cooks to co-defense coordinator. When I asked Bob about that, and, and, and I know he'd been asked about it, but I thought he he brought up, you know, Kevin Sumlin used to be a, a co-offensive coordinator. He was actually hired. He didn't say it, uh, but he was hired by Houston, and he never called plays for Oklahoma. Now, he did do that for Texas A&M, uh, but, you know, he gets hired, and he hires Dana Holgerson, yeah. so he was a genius there. Uh, but it had been a long time since they'd had co-coordinators, and... I asked Bob, like, is that something where you want to see assistants come in and earn that that job? Like, Kerry Cooks, they probably could have promised him co-coordinator to get him here. Instead, they just promised him a multi-year contract and a really good salary. Uh, and he just got one of the biggest bumps of all the assistants. Uh, but basically, I think when these coaches came in, did a good job recruiting, proved that they're team players. And remember, I, I hate to bring this up because I almost feel bad every time I talked to Bill Biedenboe, but there was a time when he and Lincoln Riley did not get along real well when they were on the same staff. I, I, all that's been smoothed over now, but that's why I didn't think Bill Biedenboe would be a, a legitimate candidate when Oklahoma went looking for an offensive line coach and they hired him away from... I talked to people that knew them both at Tech and they were like, those two can't coexist. Like They want to kill each other. And they've gotten past all that stuff. So now they're co-coordinators together and Bill has proved, obviously, that he's a team player because Bob said, I wanted to see those guys and how they coach and how they work with our staff before I give them any kind of a co-title uh, like that. So Lincoln Riley's still running all the plays. Uh, it just means that uh, Bill has some extended responsibilities leading up to game days, things like that. Uh, it comes with a, eventually comes with a higher salary, uh, more prestige, same thing with Kerry Cook. So uh, it's really a way for Bob to reward it, and it... it pretty much shows that uh, he really loves the staff that he's put together. When you talk too. about the OU run game, there is a lot of credit given to Bill Beatenbo and the, the way that they scheme towards the middle of the year and then yeah. even at the end of the year. Yeah, I was about to say that, Eddie. I wouldn't be surprised on offense, especially if they don't split it up into more of like a Lincoln Riley. I mean, he's going to call the plays and oversee everything and sign off on everything, but he'll be more of the passing game coordinator while B- Bill Beatenbo's the rushing game coordinator, which is something NFL teams kind of do. And then on defense, Kerry Cooks uh, was brought up by like Jordan Evans and Ahmad Thomas both as a guy that they just loved hanging out with outside of football as a guy that connects with kids well. So I think that's smart by Bob to give him a promotion, keep him around, uh, keep a great recruiter and a coach who's proven to have results on the field. Uh, uh, keep him around. Keep him happy. Uh, that's what you got to do. By the way, the other big thing, and I think we should hit on this right before we get out of here, uh, the Big 12 is a conference. We all we get done on Tuesday – 
I saw a tweet from George Schroeder uh, saying, you know, sources are telling him that Big 12 is going to table expansion. When in the the uh, presidents were over in Irving, meeting where you know they always meet in Irving, and. I remember I was out in the parking garage at lunch, and I saw Jake Trotter leave, and I was like, Jake, where are you going? He's like, oh, I'm going over to Irving to the, the Big 12 thing. And so I thought nothing would come of it. I started packing my stuff, was, was trying to get back here, had the radio in the morning. Uh, you guys stayed there, and then all of a sudden, I'm on the highway, and I see a couple tweets coming out saying, uh, and you heard about the ACC stuff but right about the same time. And I see the tweets coming out, Big 12 is going to explore expansion. I mean, it I, it blew me away to see them change that much over the last week. It, it's truly amazing. And it's so, it's so reactionary from uh, the ACC news that came out uh, with the them signing on to a long-term deal with ESPN and starting their own network. And, uh, you know, it's, once again, the Big 12 is just left standing there having to make decisions. Uh, I don't know about the, I guess, pretty much about the longevity of the conference, which I... I don't know. We'll see. I think that now, I think I, I was I was adamant that there should be no expansion. Now I've come over to the side. Go get four teams. Do it big. Do I don't know that I'm at four. The big fourteen. I'm at look. I'm I'm kind of of the opinion. Well, I tell you what. Before we do that, let's hear from David Bourne real quick. Uh, as he talks about kind of the next step for this conference. Uh, now that they're going to explore expansion. Now, they haven't officially said we're going to expand. They're just going to talk with other teams that are interested in joining the Big 12, basically. Well, I think the next steps really are, unfortunately, I'm sure he doesn't volunteer for all this extra work, but they're in the commissioner's hands. He will uh, follow up back with these individual universities. Uh, he will collect more data. He'll evaluate their seriousness. He will evaluate uh, the potential terms that they might be willing uh, to have in terms of their uh, coming into the conference. So he'll, pr he'll present us uh, with a whole series of recommendations and findings and evaluations after he's had an opportunity to consult with them individually. Whoever uh, wants to put some money under the table to Bob Bowlesby, now's your time. Whoever wants to take him on a cruise or... You know, vacation to the south of France. He was quoted in the Dallas Morning News today saying that uh, he's he's a very popular person right now with teams reaching out to him and uh, and trying to get their uh, pretty much, I guess, the catch the eye of the Big 12. But uh, Bob, go kick the guys at Cincinnati right in the nuts for me. All right. I don't want Cincinnati. In this hear, hearing those guys brag about all the calls they were receiving from teams is like listening to somebody brag about uh, having all of the attractive people in the high school already have dates to the prom. And now I'm the best one left. That's basically it. Now all the ugly people in school are coming to me. And aren't I so popular? It's like, oh, congratulations. Or about how many I, yeah. hookers you've slept with. It's like, okay, congratulations. I, Cincinnati's calling you. whoop de doo I, I mean, at, at some point, you know, my my two cents before I have to get out of here is, uh, if you're going to, I, I kind of like the, the four team football only idea. I, maybe it's a little early. I need to look into it more. But I find that intriguing. Especially when you could add a team like Central Florida, which is the largest enrollment in the country. It's in Florida. You can add Cincinnati, which is in Ohio. You could add Memphis, which puts you in Tennessee in a big market. And you could add BYU, get you in the Salt Lake City market. And, you know, th those aren't the home runs that you could have had a few years ago. But at some point, you just got to cut bait and do the best you can at this point. All right. Well, uh, we've got to end the show. Uh, let's go ahead and do that now. I will just say this. Uh, more to come on the Big 12 and expansion and all that stuff. All right, so it was fun. Appreciate you, Joe Duvall. Appreciate Eddie Radosevic. Uh, Big 12 Media Days. We'll be back again for another Sooner Scoop podcast soon. We'll see you then.